Okay, now we're going to be talking about the circumstances when people will uh, want to join with groups. Uh, affiliation, which again, you know, you, you want to, you know, being joining with others, affiliating with others, kind of getting together with others. Well, when are these things going to happen? Well, when you are uh, facing uncertain circumstances, you know, when you are scared, stressful circumstances might be a time in which people will want to join with others. Not necessarily when they're embarrassed though. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But joining a group allows you to get what is called social comparison. Being able to uh, see what's happening with other people and compare it with what's happening with you. And that's what we're going to be talking about next. Very important theory by Festing, or social comparison theory, is that the idea is that what we, we do this all the time, is that we are frequently comparing ourselves with others. For example, how many times have you taken a test in a college class and then after the test gotten together with your... Uh, with your classmates and said, how did you do? What did you get? I got this. What did you get? What did you get? What did you get? Well, that's all a part of, a part of social comparison. You are wanting to see how you evaluate where you are with others. You know, again, if you show you that you did poorly on an exam and everybody else did poorly, you certainly feel a lot better. If you did well and everybody else did well, okay. If you did poorly and everybody else did well, well, then you would not be very happy. So social comparison is you're, you're getting information from other people and by doing that you're learning more. Okay, And this is particularly going to happen in, this, in ambiguous circumstances. In ambiguous circumstances such as when you don't know how everybody else did on the exam as an example, uh, you would want to uh, look around and get, get information from others. So this is essentially what you do. So you, you know, when you're in these ambiguous circumstances, you may be, have a feeling of a negative emotion, or just a feeling of uncertainty, or just in general you just want information. Well, affiliation and social comparison is a way in which you can gain this information. And once you've gained this information, it's no longer ambiguous. Now you've got cognitive clarity. So if you really bombed a psychology exam. You're in a you have negative emotions. You're uncertain about things. But when you find out that everybody else bombed too, maybe you don't feel so bad. And now it becomes clear. Okay, it was a really hard test, and that and so now I understand. Okay, and again, this is so. This is just an example of when people might affiliate with others. Uh, Schachter did some classic studies looking at, uh, you know, uh, joining groups in these, uh, you know, scary, unpleasant circumstances. And you can read more about it in the textbook. But one of the lessons that we learned from this study is that misery does indeed love company. You know that famous expression. And when you are going to be, ex when people are going to be experiencing some kind of an unpleasant circumstance, they do want to be with others and they want to affiliate with others. This is particularly true when you are uh, kind of all in the same boat. If, all, if a whole group of people are going to be experiencing something unpleasant, this is a group that you want to be with. You want to be with people who are going to be kind of in the same boat as you, experiencing something unpleasant. Okay? Even better, affiliating with people who already experience the unpleasant thing and can then give you social comparison information to be able to say, I went through it, it wasn't so bad, you'll get through it too. Inspirational. You think about issues about, uh, you know, groups who have, you know, people who have cancer, let's say, they join support groups. This fits right in with that, in that you can, particularly people perhaps who have 
uh, gone through chemo and have gotten through it, maybe the cancer's in remission, they want to be with people who you know, just got diagnosed with cancer, you know, might want to affiliate with people who have this experience and gone through it. And it gives them a lot more information about what they're going to go through. And even can I give them inspiration on how to, uh, you know, cope with it well. Okay. So these frightening situations, you know, you want to affiliate with others, and that's what the research seems to show. On the other hand, it doesn't seem to happen when the experience is in, involves embarrassment. Apparently, if people are going to be experiencing some kind of an embarrassing situation, it's not a, that both unpleasant and embarrassing, well, in those kind of situations, people actually don't really want to affiliate. They'd rather kind of stick, stay by themselves. Even if they know other people are going to be in, in, involved in the same thing. So apparently, when it comes to a fear circumstance, comes to an ambiguous circumstance, you tend to want to, uh, you know, you know, you don't, you want to be with others, get information and whatnot. But when you are with, uh, when you're in an embarrassing situation, you tend to uh, withdrawal seems to be a more uh, common reaction in those kinds of circumstances. talk a little bit about stress. When you are under stress, when there is a threat to your well-being, such as an upcoming final exam, let's say. Affiliation is a way in which some people can choose to uh, deal with it. Okay? Let's say we're dealing with an imminent threat coming up. Okay? Some uh, circumstance that is, uh, you know, that, that really is something that might be a little bit scary. Well, you can have two kind of responses. You can have a fight response or a flight response. And this has to do with dealing with this imminent threat that has to be dealt with right away. Joining into groups is protective. You can, by joining groups, it makes you stronger. It makes you perhaps a better, a better able to deal with a threat. Okay, you think about, uh, Think about, for example, uh, a terrorism attack. The terrorism attack in uh, on 9/11. It drew a lot of people together, and then they uh, they wanted to kind of get together, and um, you know, kind of respond to it and respond to it, you know, forcefully. Okay. They also, when they saw it as a long-term threat, how do we cope with this? Kind of taking a tend response. Yeah, the 9/11 example is probably a better example for the tend and befriend response because that was something you couldn't respond to right away. Uh, but if you're dealing with an imminent threat, uh, the, fight or the fight response might be important for a group getting together and fighting. The flight response might be a way joining into a group allows you to get away faster. It allows you to, to, to escape from the circumstance. Think about uh, an escape from prison. An escape from prison is something that you know really is often done not by one person but by a group of people organized and getting together, getting out of flight. With a long-term threat, where the uh, the consequences may be kind of coming over a long period of time, not right away. You know, you may want to do the old tendon befriend. You know, support your, uh, your fellow you know group members and try to get involved with other people and get them to be to to join the group get them to be get them the support that they need to befriend them so this these are our responses that we can have to stress that can be satisfied in joining groups um Joining groups gives you a lot of support. It uh, and in one way it can give you a sense of belonging. You feel as if you belong to this group, and you feel as you're wanted there. And boy, that's a nice feeling. And by by joining that group, by going joining to this group that really likes you and they really want you there, boy, that is a good way of dealing with a stressful, unpleasant circumstance. And uh, that's something we can all think about doing, you know, we, we're, if we're dealing with something unpleasant. 
you know, join up with a group where, where we are liked and appreciated. It makes us feel better. Likewise, when you think about feeling better, it's that emotional support that you get from the group. Maybe if you're feeling sad, this group can make you feel better. And uh, this is you know, an important uh, function that, that joining groups can have. Joining groups give you informational support. You find out more about what you need to get done. If you are confused about a circumstance, you don't know how to deal with a particular problem, join up with others and the other people who can, might be able to have some ideas that could help you deal with this issue. Uh, instrumental support, hey, you might have a big task that needs to get done. Well, you can't do it yourself, so you get a group of people together who can help you get this done. Finally, spiritual support. Uh, you, you, know, you join a church group and by joining this church group you get a sense of meaning in, uh, in life and uh, it helps you deal with these, uh, these kind of uh, maybe trivial real world issues but you kind of think of the big picture, think of uh, the meaning of life maybe getting spiritual support helps you deal with these uh, various life issues that we have to deal with. An interesting aspect of social comparison is it allows us to make both upward comparisons and downward comparisons. And doing these things in different ways can help us increase our self-esteem, make us feel better. Let's say you took a psychology exam and you got a C on it. Now C is nothing to celebrate. That's not a great grade. So you may not feel that great about getting a C. But you might choose to talk with people who got D's and F's. When you talk with people who got D's and F's, well, you know you did better than them. And when you can compare yourself with them, you feel better. That's downward social comparison. Now there are some uh, negative con ne negative examples with some uh, some pretty bad examples of this when you think about it. There are people who will try when you think about prejudice and discrimination. There will people who engage in do downward social comparison to kind of put down people from a particular group to make them feel better. And that's you know one of the factors that that, lead, that leads to discrimination. People making downward social comparisons. So sometimes you know you may be fooling yourself, you know, increasing your self-esteem by making putting other people down, and that's just not right. But we do this all the time. Upward social comparison is you are comparing yourself to people who are. Um, performing better, actually the better, not more poorly, so this, the slide here is incorrect. Uh, your comparison targets are performing better than you, and when you do that, uh, you are increasing your level of optimism. You, you say, hey, you, you got something to shoot for. So you say, oh, this person is doing pretty well, let me try to shoot for that. You know, it has to be something obviously that you think that you can actually accomplish. If you see someone doing it, you say, yeah, I can do that. I can uh, improve, and and you know, you, you know, it makes yourself feel better when you can when you can make that upward social comparison. But that is if you feel as if you can do that. However, there's a catch with that. If there is a particular aspect of yourself, a particular ability that you have, a particular aspect of your self concept that you think is really really important and you value very very highly. So you think that you are an awesome, awesome chess player. Well, maybe if you find somebody who uh, does better than you, who is better than you in chess, you might not feel happy about comparing yourself to that person because that ability in chess is really a big part of your self-esteem. When you compare, when you make that kind of awkward social comparison. It's uh, not going to be particular. You're not, you're not going to be particularly happy about that. So if you've got a brother or a sister who might be better at chess than you, and chess is really important part of you, 
you're probably not going to be happy comparing yourself. You're probably going to maybe you have some hostility towards that uh, brother or sister when it comes to chess. On the other hand, what if you have a brother or sister who is really good at tennis, and tennis is not particularly important to you, and your brother or sister wins a lot of tennis tournaments? And you say, "Whoa, I'm really proud of my uh, of my brother or sister for doing that." In that case, you're going to be burging. Remember basking in reflected glory? You're going to be looking up to them because you're going to be making an upward social comparison. You're going to say, oh, my brother is great. My sister is great. Uh, and the reason you're going to say that is because tennis isn't that important to you. So that self-evaluation maintenance model is very interesting when it comes to that and that we choose the areas in which we want to make those upward social comparisons. And we don't really want to do it, again, with people when it's dealing with uh, something that's really, really important to us. And again, this is reflected here in, the, in, this, uh, in this particular model here. So if you take a look here, you can see when they're comparing themselves with a friend, a friend is someone you often want to compare yourself with, uh, when the task is not particularly relevant to you, you recognize that your, your friend performed better and you're okay with that. But uh, if, you're, if it's something that is very important to you, you kind of kind of downgrade uh, how you think your friend did because it's a, it's a task that's very highly relevant to you.